Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Two down at the front, please. Here we are. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to a city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the multitudes with one accord gave heed to what was said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs which he did. For unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed, crying with a loud voice, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the nation of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all gave heed to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is that power of God which is called great. And they gave heed to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for it had not yet fallen on any of them. But they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may happen, may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. And he arose and went. And behold, an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a minister of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture which he was reading was this, As a sheep led to the slaughter, or a lamb before its shearer is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken up from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, pray, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news of Jesus. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What is to prevent my being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught up Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. 
but Philip was found at Azotus, and passing on he preached the gospel to all the towns till he came to Caesarea. We'll come back to that in a moment. Now I'm sorry it's so warm and uh, stuffy in here tonight. I went to see the manager of the Ivanano Theatre and asked if we could have that for our Sunday services. It's got air conditioning, but I'm afraid uh, it wasn't available. If you know of any alternative building that would give us a little more air, we'd be glad to hear from you. Now then, we're going to look at Acts 8, which is the passage we've come to in our series, but we could hardly have a more appropriate passage for John and Rena to remember as they leave us for their missionary work. And the whole chapter tells us how surprisingly quickly the gospel of Jesus spread. It was jumping over man-made barriers very quickly. It not only spread from one country to another, it spread from one race to another within months of the first sermon being preached. And in this chapter we find the gospel not only going to Samaria, that half-caste people, very disliked by the true Jew. But in this chapter we have the first mention of the gospel of Jesus going to Africa, the continent where John and Rena are going to this week. So that it's most appropriate, this is the beginning of the gospel going to Africa. This Ethiopian lived in what is now the Sudan, not quite modern Ethiopia, which is a little further to the south and higher up in the mountains. But it's quite clear that the people are related because the Ethiopians of the Bible are described in their physical appearance and that physical appearance suits the modern Ethiopians. So they must have migrated up the hills. Well now, back to the beginning of the chapter, which is not concerned with the Ethiopians, but with the Samaritans. And the amazing thing is that the program for Christianity, which was a world program, was not promoted by any society or committee or even any individual. Jesus gave them the program when he said, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But there was held no committee. There was founded no missionary society. And you almost feel that by accident Christianity spread because the thing that moved it first from the Jewish nation to the Samaritans was persecution. It was not a deliberate decision. They were scattered abroad by persecution. And in fact, Saul was promoting the spread of Christianity long before he became a Christian. We're told that they were running away from Saul when they went to Samaria. And here was Saul who was fighting to stamp out Christianity and the more he fought, the further he spread it. It shows again that God can so use the wrath of men to praise himself that he can use you to spread the gospel of Christ even before you converted. God has the power to overrule the malice of men to accomplish his own purpose. Now I have told you before of the Anglo-Saxon translation of verse 4, but it's so lovely I must repeat it. In the old Anglo-Saxon Bible, I've only once seen a copy, it says in verse 4, and everywhere they went they gossiped the word. They gossiped the word. These were not professional preachers. These were ordinary men and women like ourselves, and everywhere they went they gossiped the word of God. They just talked about it at the shop, in the backyard, over the garden fence, down the street, in the fields, at the well, and they just gossip. No wonder it spread. Now we must bear in mind that there is, or there was, a real tension between Jew and Samaritan. It was partly to do with racial purity, <clears throat> but it was more than that. It was due to many factors into which we needn't go. But they hated the sight of each other. They didn't talk to each other. And there is a remarkable story in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus and his disciples go to a Samaritan village and they are thrown out forcibly. 
And John, the disciple, who was still a son of thunder, that was Jesus' nickname for him, Boanerges, hothead. John, the son of thunder, said, Shall we call down fire from heaven on these Samaritans because they won't have us in their village? And Jesus said, No, you don't know what stuff you're made of. You don't know how to act yet. And that very man, John, was going to have to come back to the city of Samaria and lay... <coughs> lay hands on these people and call down the fire of the Holy Spirit from heaven. Such was the change in this man John that the people he'd wanted to destroy and wipe off the face of the earth, he came back to lay hands on them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Fire from heaven. Well now Philip was the man who started it all. He was a deacon. He'd been put in charge of the serving of the tables in the church. And he was one of those who ran for his life to Samaria. And when he ran, he preached. And when he got there, he preached with such effect that he got huge crowds listening. And they listened because they saw. Now God gave us two gates into our minds and souls, the ear gate and the eye gate. Secular education has only recently discovered the need to educate people both ways. To speak to their ears and to let them see. And now it's become almost a commonplace that you must use visual aids in day and Sunday schools. I've discovered that even with adults this is not a bad thing from time to time. To see as well as to hear. But when you see as well as hear, you learn and you're interested. And they could see the gospel at work as well as hear about it. And the eye gate and the ear gate combined and they said, Philip, we want to listen to what you've got to say because we can see what you do. And it is this double testimony which God is longing the church to give. I have told you about Edgar Wallace, the mystery thriller writer, who lived opposite that saintly man of God, the Reverend Benjamin Hellier, and said, as long as I live near Ben Hellier, I cannot be an atheist. He could see as well as hear. And when people can see things happening and lives being transformed dramatically, then they are ready to hear the gospel and they will say, what is it that you have to say? And Philip had a great time. Many of them were baptized. Many of them were set free from demon possession, which is not the same as mental illness. Many of them had diseases cured. And they were baptized in the name of the Lord, and it says there was much joy in that city. It's not usual that a city is very happy to receive alien immigrants, displaced persons, refugees. This city was thrilled to see them because they brought an answer to so many problems. And they welcomed them with open arms, even though they were Jews, even though they came from a hated nation. When these things happen, People are just thrilled to see them. Now there was a man called Simon and we are introduced to him with the word but. It's one of the saddest words in the Bible. It usually comes after a description of something wonderful. And then there comes but. And something is then said that spoils it. And so frail and weak are we in our human nature that we invariably spoil a work of God. There's always somebody around to be the but. Somebody comes into the situation to ruin it. And there was a man there who was a black magician. He was the equivalent of what you may find in villages in the Congo, the witch doctor. He was the man who dabbled in religious magic. The man who claimed to have the power of the great God. The man who was looked up to and feared and held in awe. A man who had prestige as well as power. And this man admitted that he was beaten by Philip. He had never seen things happen in his own power like this. And while it is true that the devil through black magic can give people amazing powers, those powers cannot reach the power of God. Do you remember when Moses turned his stick into a snake? in front of Pharaoh and Pharaoh called his witch doctor and said can you do that and they said we think we can and they did it by black magic 
And it looked as if their magic was as strong as Moses' miracle until Moses told his snake to swallow up theirs. It's a wonderful story, that. I love it. I just try and imagine that one sort of slithering the other one down its throat. And that was the end of the black magic. There is something in black magic. Don't ever laugh at it. Take it desperately seriously and never dabble in it. And that is why a missionary does well to respect the witch doctor for the power he can have from Satan. And it is more than natural power. But let the missionary also be quite sure the power of Jesus is greater than any power he has. The missionary's snake can swallow up that one. And the power of Jesus is more powerful than any black magic. And so Simon admitted he was beaten. And he said, I want to believe. Can I be baptized? And they welcomed him. I have no doubt if it happened today, he'd be on the Christian circuit very quickly. Come and hear the converted witch doctor. He'd be talking all around the place and crowds would be flocking to hear this dramatic conversion story. That's sometimes the mistake we make when there is a dramatic conversion. And we sometimes too early assume that it is genuine. We'll see why it's introduced with the word but in a moment. But now let's move on. Here was this great revival. People were coming, hearing the gospel, seeing it, believing, getting baptized, filled with joy. But there was one thing missing, as I said last Sunday morning. They had not yet received the power which Philip had. Now I suppose if they'd asked some people today, they'd have been told not to want it. They'd have been said, well, if God gives power to Philip, you don't need it. They would have said, well, you received the Holy Ghost when you believed. You don't need anything more. They'd have been told all kinds of things. But in those days, they didn't talk like this. They said, we want you to have the power that we've got. We want you to have a dose of the Holy Spirit's supernatural strength as we've had an anointing of pouring out. And somehow it didn't come. I don't know if they tried I don't know if they prayed or if they asked or if Philip laid his hands on anyone, but it didn't come. And they were running on only three out of four cylinders, less than full power. Now there has been much speculation as to why the Holy Ghost did not come on them in power at first. One reason given by some is that you've got to have an apostle around before this can happen. I don't believe that because in the next chapter a dear old boy called Ananias who was certainly not an apostle was able to help Paul to receive this gift. Others say, well, some Christians have a ministry of helping others into this power and some do not. There may be an element of truth in this. I'll tell you why I think God held back this power in this case. Because he didn't want a Samaritan church separated from the Jewish church. And so he made them wait until they'd got Jewish Christians with them from Jerusalem before the Holy Spirit was poured out. And in this way there would never be a division. There wouldn't have been two denominations at this point. And I'm sure this is why God waited. And Peter and John came down and here is John. The John who said, Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven and destroy them? They're so rude to you. It takes faith to talk like that, but it's faith without love. And when John came back the next time in this chapter to this very same place, he had love as well as faith. He wanted fire from heaven, but not to destroy them, but to fill them with power. And so they prayed. And the literal translation of the next verse would say, as they laid hands on them, they received one by one the Holy Spirit. In other words, as they laid hands on a person, the power was poured out. This was their confirmation. Not by the apostle, but by God giving the Holy Ghost. And so down the line they went, and Simon's eyes were popping out of his head. Now, I don't know what he saw and heard, but I'll tell you this. He saw and heard something. Simon wouldn't given, have given a penny if nothing happened. But it was precisely because when the Holy Ghost is poured out, things happen 
to the person on whom he comes that Simon reached for his checkbook and Simon said I'd like to buy that trick and revealed incidentally exactly how he'd got all his other tricks for his black magic he'd bought them probably paid through the nose for some of them and he said Peter this is great you just touch someone and and, and these things happen to them could I have that power look I'll, I'll give you a check for your cause I'll give you a handsome donation if you'll give me the power to lay hands on people now Simon was a man whose heart had two things in it which a man's heart should not have and will not have if he has truly repented and believed in the Lord Jesus these are what they are first he had a boasting heart second he had a bargaining heart and if you've really come to the Lord Jesus those are the two things that vanish when you come he was a man who was still concerned about his own prestige a man who still wanted to be looked up to by everybody else a man who still wanted powers that other people didn't have a man who wanted to be top dog a man who was a boastful man and here was a man who thought that you can buy from God the gifts that God is willing to give now a boastful bargaining heart reveals straight away that a man is not truly converted because if you've really repented and known the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ which is a free gift you never again try to buy things from God you can't you receive it all as a gift you can't bargain with God after he's forgiven you a sinner and the effect of being forgiven is precisely this that you will not bargain with God from then on you will not say God if I give you money will you do this you will not hear a forgiven sinner talk like that a person who's had free forgiveness written in the blood of Jesus saying to God I'll buy that from you you would never hear it and you would not hear a new convert trying to get prestige above everybody else by buying some power no this just told Peter something terrible about this man this was a man who had professed faith and been baptized but had not been converted and it is comforting and challenging that the New Testament is honest enough to say that even Peter and John could make mistakes and Philip and no one claims that the church today is any less fallible than this and it is terribly possible from time to time to make a mistake and to baptize someone on profession of faith whose heart is not right with God fortunately it is rare but when it occurs it needs to be dealt with straight away or that person will be left in a position of false security and think that they are alright and Peter says to perdition with you and your money you think you can buy the gifts of God you think you can have prestige above everybody else you better repent of this quickly before God punishes you for this false profession you've made you've not repented of your sin you're missing out on two cylinders not just one you haven't been filled with the Holy Ghost but you haven't repented either you've said you believed but I don't believe it you've only been baptized and that's not enough repent quickly now from the rest of the story we know that the man did not repent Peter said you pray to the Lord and the man said no you pray to the Lord that none of this will happen to me he is more concerned about his skin than his sin which is true of a lot of people from Cain onwards we don't know what happened to this man after this from the Bible but legend and tradition tells us that this man consistently opposed Peter and Paul for the rest of his days I don't know how true that is it's a very strong tradition that's come down to us but I, I know this that if you take the Oxford English Dictionary and you turn to the letter S and then look up one word simony s-i-m-o-n-y you'll discover it's a word in our English language to mean those who think they can buy something from God particularly in church status 
Those who think that by giving a handsome check they can get their name on a foundation stone. Those who want to buy with cash some status in God's house. Simony is the name we give to the attitude like that. When we give our money we're not buying anything. It may interest you to know it probably costs about three and six per person per Sunday to provide you with the opportunity of worship you have here. But you're not putting that money in to buy that. So much heating in the winter, <laughs> so much fan in the summer, so much hot air from the pulpit all the time. You're not paying for that. You're giving to God. You're not thinking that you buy when you come into this place. It's not a religious supermarket. You come to give because you have received from God freely. Freely you have received, freely give. Simony is the attitude that buys. Well, let's move on from this unhappy event. Peter and John went back to Jerusalem. They didn't waste their journey. They preached all the way. But now we come to the lovely story, my favorite story in the New Testament, or it was. Now everyone is, but... The first sermon I preached was from this uh, text, so it takes me back 24 years, 23 years, to a little chapel up in the north of England where I preached my first sermon from this text. It was a good deal shorter than the ones I preach nowadays, but it, it said the same thing as I'm going to say. Because I've looked back at my notes and there isn't a thing in the notes that I preached my first sermon that I would want to alter. Jesus is the same, the gospel is the same, and this kind of thing is still happening, so why should one change? I hope I've developed an understanding. Now there is a stark contrast between the fertile valleys of Samaria and the desert of Gaza. And there's a great contrast between the urban areas of Cheshire and Guildford and the Congo River. A great contrast. And there's a great contrast, too, between the multitudes listening in Samaria to a congregation of one in the Gaza Desert Strip. But God wants Philip to do both. And it is vital that a man should have as much time for the one as for the many and should go to preach the gospel to one if the Holy Spirit directs and should go to a place that is quite uncongenial as well as those that are congenial. I can only say that some of the happiest services I have ever had were with a congregation of one. Dear old Isa Clark lived in a little cottage on one of the headlands of the Shetland Islands. She was in her late 70s or early 80s when I knew her. A Scandinavian woman, she looked as if she'd come over with the Vikings. Big, tough, strong. And there was a little chapel just near her cottage. And there was a ship's bell on the roof. And when I got through, in either by boat or by van, uh, she would go and she'd stand outside and pull the ship's bell to call the people. And you would see boats coming up the, the Vaux, the inlets. And you might see somebody walking over the hills. And dear old Isa used to be out there ringing the bell in all weathers. We had gales up there that really are gales. You don't know what gales are down here. And she would stand there being battered and blown and soaked through, ringing the bell. And if no one came, she would always say to me, now we're going to have the full service. The Lord's here, I'm here, you're here. I want the whole lot. And she would have it. I would run from the collection plate to the organ. <laughs> I would take a collection, play the organ, and then back into the pulpit and give Isa Clark the word of God. I'm sure she's in glory now, but I'll tell you, those services with a congregation of one were very near to heaven. Wonderful. You can have a great time with one. Great time with one. And so Philip was told to leave the fertile valleys and the multitudes and the revival going on in Samaria and to go into the middle of the desert to find one man. Mind you, a most extraordinary man. A man who was disqualified on a number of counts from worshipping in the temple at Jerusalem, yet he'd been up to stand outside and pray to the God of the Jews. A man who couldn't enter the courts of the Lord because he was an Ethiopian. 
That kept him out of the court of the Jews. He was only allowed into the court of the Gentiles. But a man who was also a eunuch, whether by accident or deliberately or by birth, and a man who was a eunuch was forbidden even to go into the court of the Gentiles by the Mosaic law. And this man who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer of Ethiopia, of Queen Candace in charge of all her treasure, was humble enough to go to a foreign land where he knew he'd not be allowed in the temple and stand outside and pray because this man was seeking God in reality. In his own country, people worship the sun, as most people in England do today. And he, they worship the sun, and they prostrated themselves before the sun, as so many of our fellow countrymen do. That's what they're doing today. Not in quite the same way as they did, because they thought the sun was alive. And he wasn't satisfied with the worship of the sun, and he traveled all that way seeking truth. I have a great respect for this man. He's a very humble, modest man. He's saying, I want the truth even if I have to stand outside your temple to find it, but I'm determined to get to the truth. And somebody had given him a bit of the Bible, a gospel tract it would be in our day, but somebody had given him a scroll of Isaiah. And he was on his way back with all his retinue walking in front and behind, and he was in his carriage, and he was reading this scroll. He'd never read anything like it. It was the best bit of the scriptures they could have given him, considering they only had the Old Testament. It was the book Isaiah. But he was finding it heavy going. Most people who read the Bible before they know Jesus find it very heavy going. And he didn't understand it, but he plodded all the way through. He got to chapter 53 by the time he got to Isaiah. He couldn't have got stuck in a better place. And then Philip came up to the chariot and here was Philip, a very ordinary little man, and there was this Chancellor of the Exchequer in his carriage and all his retinue, and the Holy Ghost said, you go right up there and talk to this man. Holy boldness is needed. Not far from here in a church, a preacher said to his congregation, if you have an impulse to speak to somebody about Jesus, follow that impulse no matter who it is. And a dear lady sitting listening to him, thought of George Brown, the foreign secretary as he was then, and thought, I wonder if anybody's told him about the Lord Jesus. And she thought, well, that's a silly idea, and put it out of her head, but it came back again, George Brown, George Brown. And she thought, well, the minister said, you must talk to whoever you get an impulse to talk to. And so she looked out for George Brown. Now, she did have a job in high circles, and she thought it was a chance that she might meet him. And so she looked out for him for months. And she never did. So she finally got on her knees. And she said, Lord, if you've told me to speak to him about you, then you'll have to bring him to me. And she decided to write a letter to him, which she did. And she thought, well, that'll be the end of that. He must get loads of letters from all kinds of queer people. Two days later, she went into a shop in London, and there was George Brown standing at the counter. She went up to him and spoke to him. And he said, are you the lady that sent me that letter? <laughs> and she said, yes. And he promised to go with her to a church. I illustrate that because I think that's an up-to-date example of what happened here. Philip, go and speak to the Chancellor of the Exchequer about Jesus. Me? Yes, you. Now, don't all go rushing off to the Prime Minister, will you, as soon as we finish this service. But God has no respect of persons. God might send you to anyone at the top of the social ladder at the bottom. There are up and outs as well as down and outs, and God may send you to either. But when the Holy Spirit says, go and join this person and talk to them, you must go. And Philip, this ordinary little man, went and jumped up into the chariot with the Chancellor of the Exchequer and said, what are you reading? Do you understand all that? And the man said, well, no, I need someone to tell me. And so Philip talked to him. When D.L. Moody came to this country as an evangelist, he was under some suspicion from uh, ministers of churches in this country. And uh, he met a number of them and they said, Mr. Moody, would you please write out what you believe so that we may examine it to see if it's sound? 
and to see if it's orthodox. They didn't know anything about this young American evangelist. So he said, well, actually it is in print. So they said, well, where can we get a copy of it so that we could study it? And he said, well, you've probably got a copy of it on your shelves. And they said, well, what is it then? And he said, it's Isaiah chapter 53. He said, the only thing I'll preach while I'm here is he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is the very chapter that this Ethiopian was reading. And he said, I don't understand, is Isaiah talking about himself? Or who is this amazing person who can take your sins unto himself and take them off you? Who is it? And Philip, I'm so sorry about the translation I read to you. No translation is perfect and there's a most disappointing thing here. It says really, then Philip, beginning with this scripture, preached, preached. Not just spoke to him or told him, but preached. We must get away from the idea that preaching is a pulpit and a crowd in front sitting passively. Preaching is just talking to someone on the bus. Preaching is telling anyone about Jesus. And beginning at the same scripture, he preached Jesus. We're not offering a system. We're not offering a church, a denomination, an organization, a philosophy. We're offering Jesus and the secret of every great servant and missionary of God is the person who goes to take Jesus to people. Not the person who goes to make people Baptists or anything else, God forbid. The person who begins with Jesus. That is the great secret of the Christian religion. We don't offer a philosophy. We don't offer a way of life. We don't offer a system, an organization, an institution. We offer Jesus. We offer a person. And only a person such as Jesus can satisfy and meet the needs of men. And so he said that was all about Jesus. And he talked to him about Jesus. And then the Ethiopian said, now look, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? I'm going to tell you just by way of relaxation a lovely little story about a group of Southern Baptist ministers from America who went for a trip in the Holy Land and one day the guide said, would you like to go and see where the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized? And they all said yes, they'd all preached on this so they all thought, now I'll be able to say I've been there. So off they went in the coach, down to the Gaza Strip and then the guide said, out you get and they all got out in the desert and he said this is the spot where the Ethiopian unit was baptized. And there was a little trickle of water, not half an inch deep, running through. And all these Baptists, their jaws dropped. All their ideas began to crumble and crash. And they said to the guide, but are you sure it was here? He said, yes. And uh, they said, but uh, is there nowhere else where it could be? No, he said, this is the only place there's water in the Gaza Strip. And then, of course, somebody realized and said, uh, what time of year was it when the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized? And they asked the guide, and at the right time of year, that is not just a little trickle, it's a great big stream. It's a great big torrent that anybody could be baptized in. But the important thing is this, the Ethiopian said, what hinders me to be baptized? Now you see the glory of that question. The glory is this. He couldn't get into the Jewish religion. He was a eunuch. He was an Ethiopian. He couldn't get in. He said, is there anything could keep me out of this religion? And, and Philip said, no. If you believe you can come right in, you can be baptized. Doesn't matter if you're a eunuch. Doesn't matter if you're an Ethiopian. Doesn't matter if you're Chancellor of the Exchequer. You can be in Christ. You can be baptized. And this is the difference between the Jewish and the Christian religion. The Christian religion is for whosoever believeth. And it doesn't matter if you're speaking to a Chinaman, an African, an Indian, an Englishman, a Scotsman, an Irishman, or what? Or a Jew. You can say, nothing hinders you to become a Christian except your lack of faith. And so the Ethiopian eunuch who had been shut out of the temple in Jerusalem was welcomed right into Jesus and baptized. I find that very moving. And so they went down into the water, and in front of all his servants, this man was humiliated and dipped in the water and baptized. 
the highest in the land, next to the queen. And here he is, humbly being lowered into the water, brought to the level of every other sinner seeking the grace of Christ. And immediately afterwards, Philip vanished. Clearly, the language implies a supernatural transportation of this man of God to one of the Philistine cities. The Philistines had been enemies of the Jews for over a thousand years, but Philip was found in one of their cities. And he went on preaching his way all up the coast to Caesarea. And the Ethiopian never saw him again. Now, you'd have thought that would have made him sad. So many questions he wanted to ask. All he had to go back with him into Africa was one book of the Old Testament, a baptism, faith in Jesus, and that's all he had. Nothing more. But I want to spend the centuries now and tell you something else. I've been to Ethiopia, I've talked to Christians there, I've heard something of the story. Why did this Ethiopian come to Jerusalem? Do you know that when Solomon had a visit from the Queen of Sheba, she lived just over the sea from Ethiopia. And there were close relations between Ethiopia and what is now the Yemen, which was then Sheba. And there is a clear link going back as far as that. The present emperor, Haile Selassie, claims to be, I don't know how much truth there is in it, claims to be a direct descendant of an illegitimate son between Solomon and Sheba. Whether that is legend or tradition, I do not know, but I'll tell you this. It is almost certain that we can trace back Jewish influence in Ethiopia to the time of Solomon. That may be how the Ethiopian came to Jerusalem. And I will now tell you another remarkable fact. Out of the great continent of Africa, with its teeming people, that great continent of Africa, there is only one area in Africa that has remained Christian from the de earliest days of Christianity, and it's Ethiopia. All the other lands lost Christianity, if ever they had it. All the Christian churches along the North African coast were obliterated by Islam. The Africans elsewhere in that great continent remained in their primitive and superstitious animism. But there was one country that for 2,000 years has been Christian by tradition, and it's this country. And here we have this one man, and Philip preached to this one man who inherited this Jewish tradition, influencing his country for nearly a thousand years. And from him there is an unbroken chain of Christian tradition for another 2,000. And Philip went out of his way to speak to one man. You will never know, never know what could happen as a result of speaking to one man about Jesus. You'll never know. John and Rena, you're going to take the gospel to Africa. You're going to teach them how to grow their own food, you're going to teach them about Jesus and our prayers and love will be with you. You'll have crowds out there, it may not be a change from the multitude to the individual, but I want you to be ready to speak to both. There will be crowds that will want to come and listen to you. There will be individuals you need to meet alone, maybe not in the desert but in the jungle. Just talk to about Jesus. You're going to be living on the edge of a lake so you'll be baptizing. And people will say, see, here is water at your front door. What doth hinder me to be baptized? They won't say it like that, but they'll say it. And you'll take part in baptisms. I think the text I want to leave with you from this chapter is this. And he arose and went. The Holy Ghost said to Philip, go. And he arose and went. Now that's what we're here to share with you tonight. You've heard the call of God to go to Africa as his servants. And you're arising and going on Wednesday. This is obedience. It's not easy. It will lead you into strange and unfamiliar circumstances where people need to hear the love of Jesus. And we're so grateful to you for giving us the privilege and the opportunity of sharing in this service with you.